We talk a lot about a participatory economy, but what can be done to get there? That's the question of strategy, and it's the topic of this episode of Pep Talk. Could you please tell us uh, what you see as the alternative? Hello, and welcome to Pep Talk, the participatory economy podcast, the podcast where we discuss the democratic alternative to capitalism known as the participatory economy. I'm your host, Mitchell Strapanchik, coming to you from Chicago. In this episode, we will discuss or start try to discuss the question of strategy toward a participatory economy. I'm joined by two contributors. Um, joining us from Portland, Oregon in the United States is Robin Hanel. Uh, he's a co- one of the co-inventors of the model of the of, of a participatory economy, um, who is the author of many books. His latest book is A Participatory Economy, published by AK Press. Robin, welcome to the show. Great to be with you. And joining us from Helsinki, Finland, is Antti Jauhainen, a longtime contributor, teacher, activist, uh, and writer. Um, Antti, welcome to the show. Yeah, glad to be here. Um, well, let's talk strategy. But first, before we talk into that, we should probably define what that means. And I'd like to ask each of you of your definition. My feeling is that a strategy toward a participatory economy basically means the kinds of things that you do in the real world toward ed- making a participatory economy happen. Um, now, is that a fair definition? What do you think, Robin? Let's start with you. What do you think? I, th- I think that's a good definition. And <clears throat> my instinct is not to get too fancy about it. The left has spent a lot of time over the last hundred years um, arguing, you know, over strategy and <clears throat> And sometimes trying to make, you know, trying to treating it in a way where there's a science to strategy and, you know, whoever and and whatever political group, you know, has mastered the science of social change strategy. Well, those with that's the political group that should be leading us, you know, into the great beyond. Um, and, And I actually think that was one of the mistakes that the left made in the 20th century and makes and it's a mistake that we we tend to make worldwide less now i believe than we did in the past but yeah i think it's just simple um we can think about where we want to go and then <clears throat> that's entirely different from given where we are now how are we going to, how can we envision a strategy sort of a pathway that gets us from where where, where we are now to the place we want to go. So I, I believe in the importance of being, you know, spending some time being clear about where you want to go. Because, you know, thinking about strategy without having thought about where you want to, where you are trying to get to, I think has been also, you know, that that's, that's not something that has proven to be a very, you know, been very productive. But I, I don't, I think there's less of a sign. I also think it's very, very place specific and and time specific the right strategy in a particular country at a particular point in time isn't necessarily going to be the, the same right strategy for a different country at a different point in time and i think that's something that needs to be born born in mind andy i uh, pose the question to you um i've defined strategy do you like that would you define it differently what do you think yeah i, I echo what you two have said uh uh, in, put it in very simple terms, I think it's sort of you have a goal and you, you know, somehow try to get there. And that's strategy, how you get there. Uh, but the thing is that when you're talking about society, uh, you have, you know, crazy amounts of people, crazy am- amounts of communities who are all going into different directions. Um, and then when you think about societal change, uh, how as how together we might arrive. Now we are. In, in a limited sense, we are all, for example, living in a capitalism. And we are, everyone is moving towards somewhere, but we are still, you know, constrained by capitalism. That's where we are. Uh, what, for example, I think we are doing in the participatory economy project is trying to find a way for us to move from capitalism to a democratic economy uh, and how to find a way there. But the trick is that, you know, like Robin said, all different, you know, peoples and, and communities and, you know, everyone will most likely, it, it wouldn't work if everyone would do the same. 
that that wouldn't work. We wouldn't end up in a democratic economy, I think. Uh, instead, you know, different groups and everyone will find a different pathway, different strategy to achieve parts of that vision. Uh, and if everything goes really well, um, we might end up there. And that would be great, you know, end up moving from capitalism to a democratic economy. Um, but again, like Robin said, it's definitely not a science. It's, it's, there's too many unknowns. There's too many variables. Uh, we just don't know enough. Uh, we can know about where we're going. You know, we can have a vision, what we're in general terms aiming to have. Um, but it's, it's very difficult and, and to find, you know, place. One thing I've been doing, I was just actually doing an activist workshop about this a week ago, uh, where I wanted, wanted them to envision a uh, world 10 years from now and what positive change there would be and what strategies they'd use as activists to get there. But I gave an additional uh, assignment, which is that they would have to think about how those steps, how those achievements, which it was a positive workshop that, you know, in 10 years time, they would have positive outcomes, how those positive outcomes would help in new, even better positive outcomes in 30 years. Mm. And then the third step was in 100 years. So if, you know, in 10 years, they achieve something, activists, groups achieve something, and that, that helps them achieve new stuff that isn't possible now, but could be in 30 years time. And then what about in 100 years? So I think strategy is very important to think about, but it's unfortunately been, like Robin said, uh, especially left has been thinking about in a very strange, very uh, sort of narrow and uh, in a way that just doesn't fit how that change occurs. So it's, it's not in that sense, I think, talking about strategy can be a science that it, you know, we can verify that not uh, many approaches haven't worked this far. We haven't moved from capitalism to democratic economy. And I, I was looking at my bookshelf because there's some American uh, writer uh, and researcher. Uh, I don't remember which university he works in, but he's uh, named Corey Robin. And he has an excellent book called A Reactionary Mind, mm. um, which uh, discusses conservative uh, strategies and conservative viewpoints all the way from Adam Smith and Edmund Burke to uh, today. And one of the points actually that uh, Corey Robin has uh, is that uh, there's, he says that, for example, Adam Smith actually was a social democrat uh, all the way from the start that Adam Smith had, you know, huge amounts of what ended up as social democratic thinking in his work, uh, whereas uh, the actual conservatives like Edmund Burke in those times uh, they already showed uh, that they had sort of very clear, very dogmatic vision of a capitalism being everywhere and capitalism being the only one tool for assessing if anything is successful. Uh, Edmund Burke was very clear about it. If someone has the money to do something, then he has the right to do it. And Adam Smith was arguing against this, that he said we need a much more nuanced system. Right. Um, but the interesting thing is that while conservatives have this very uh, rigid view of how they want the world to be in the end, it's just incredible how much, how agile they are, how they can, you know, turn around their talking points and their movements and any, they, they can fit basically anything uh, under that umbrella. Um, and that's something that uh, I think sort of, I have to give credit to them, that, that more realistically, um, takes into account how societal change actually happens. It happens in very uh, surprising ways, in very, you know, various ways and, and so on. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, I On that note, I actually went through, and this kind of delves tales into Robin's work. Um, Robin, back in 2005, published a book called Economic Justice and Democracy, where he explores some questions regarding listing out strategies that people have done and could do regarding um, a promotion of a more democratic economy. Um, he lists out three main categories in that book, economic reform campaigns, uh, economic reform movements, and experiments in equitable cooperation. 
um, to talk about each of these briefly in turn. Reform campaigns refer to things that are trying to improve things in the here and now, given the systems that we have, like um, increasing wages for people, um, uh, including in reforms to tame uh, finance and corporations, uh, improving the safety net. Um, there are various e economic reform movements, uh, things like um, environmental movement, consumer rights movement, poor people's campaign, uh, the labor unions. Um, these are movements that try to um, improve capacities within our current society in various different ways. Um, and experiments in equitable cooperation um, that try to build something in the here and now uh, where there's no... Um, where to try to build the, like the seeds of a better tomorrow in the present using um, different rules of the game, as it were, things like local currency systems, worker ownership, uh, worker participation, uh, cooperatives, both producer and consumer, various participatory budgeting schemes, various intentional communities, and projects that kind of explicitly use the model of a participatory economy, things that in the past would have included things like Z Magazine, South End Press, uh, the New Standard News Project, um, the Autonomous Zone, uh, the Mondragon uh, uh, Project in Canada, not in Spain, but they're related. Things like this were examples of strategies that have been deployed. Robin, going back to 2005 and that book, it seems like these are things that people can and have done. What are your thoughts on what I just listed out that you've written back then and how that relates to things now 18 years later? You know, I'm I'm glad you summarized it because I would have done it would have been harder for me to do as good a summary of you know what what that what that whole idea about strategy you know looked like the big idea yes is that in the here and now in most places there are going to be reform movements um <clears throat> and there's going to be reform campaigns and reform simply means tackling some particularly egregious, you know, negative consequences of the present system and trying to improve outcomes. But one of the things that that I've concluded, um, and and this is something that you know that Auntie, coming from a Scand, I know I know Finland is not Scandinavia, Auntie. You don't have to tell me that. <laughs> Nordic countries. Um, the Nordic countries. It is in spirit. The, right. <laughs> Scandinavian spirit. The Nordic countries amongst the advanced economies um, pioneered more social democratic reforms of capitalism than anybody else did. And, <clears throat> and yet one of the things we discovered, um, basically starting in 1980, is that reforms not only go forward, they can go backward. Hmm. And and then the, and then the question arises, well, if your strategy is to simply incrementally reform, 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 well, there were countries and we have experiences where that was re really what was going on. That was what was being attempted. But if the struct if if certain structures are left in place, then it's also possible for reactionary forces working politically on their strategies to basically take things back rather than in break the momentum, the forward moment, momentum, um, and take things back in the opposite direction. Um, now I, I wanted to say one thing just, just to sort of highlight why I think that strategy would be so much different in different times and places. Um, there's a little place called Rojava now in the Middle East. Um, and in some sense, it's the Kurdish people, you know, created a, a place that wasn't even a country because they were fighting with Syria and Turkey over whether this was a country and how was it going to fit into one of those places or not. But they started to, I mean, they, they were engaged in a campaign, you know, to really create, you know, a very different society, a very democratic society, a very democratic economy. Um, strategy there is so much different than strategy in the United States in the present and for the past 10 years, where we had to be primarily concerned with avoiding, I mean, beating and preventing something that is, you know, 
full-scale fascism from coming to power in the most powerful country and military power on the planet. So why would you think that the right strategy for progressive people and people who want to move things forward and prevent terrible outcomes, why would you think the strategies, the right strategies in those two situations are really the same? So I think that's that that's that's how I remind myself um, not to expect that the right kind of things to do in one place is necessarily going to be. And part of the reason that I argued for a strategy which was building social movements, progressive social movements, engaging in campaigns, you know, for limited improvements, um, and combining that with attempts to build sort of what I think of as as imperfect experiments in equitable cooperation, even in the here and now, things like participatory budgeting, is if you're not, if you are not that close to where you can make an overall transformation, you have to sort of, your strategy should principally be concerned with how do you create the social conditions where you will have political forces in play, you know, that are capable of moving us, you know, taking a large step. In some places, the right strategy is how can we prepare ourselves to get to where we can take a large step forward? In other places, you may have arrived at the situation where you are now dealing with, we do have popular forces in play, they have strengths, our enemies are weaker, and how do we proceed now? Those are two, I mean, those are very different things. Yeah. Um, following through on Auntie's point regarding um, uh, Corey Rubin's book and the reactionary mind, um, I was thinking like, oh, there's also, I mean, there, I, I, you kind of have to admire the kind of like single-minded fanaticism that that folks on the right have had in deploying their vision of uh, what they consider to be the society they want and the success that they've kind of had on that score. Whereas the left, at least thus far, to a large extent, at least certainly in the United States and arguably worldwide, really hasn't. So I think that maybe that's a lesson to be learned there on that score. Um, but also um, where there's also this element on like an understanding that not only is there this element about the, you know, a, there, it's always contextual. You can't always think that the same thing that you're going to do that would work in one sort of circumstances will work somewhere else in some other time. Um, it, there's also that element of luck that's involved. I'm actually reminded here of the success that Occupy Wall Street had. This was a movement that certainly was motivated, certainly had a goal, certainly had strategy, um, and certainly had to actually think nimbly. I mean, they, they actually, in their original protest back in 2011, they actually had three parks that they were going to occupy, um, but they wound up choosing one. And it was actually their second preference, Zuccotti Park. So they had to make a decision on the spot, and they did, and it worked out well, but also galvanized by the fact that they actually caught some lucky breaks, weirdly enough, because they were, A, being attacked by police in certain protests that they had organized, and B, those attacks were recorded on video and distributed very widely. Had those attacks never happened, had they never been recorded, had they never been distributed in platforms where millions could view them, Occupy Wall Street may never have happened. So there's also that element of luck that kind of plays into things. But in some respects, you kind of also make your own luck in this regard. Thoughts on this? Yeah, uh, I would like to add uh, that uh, two things. One is a question of time span. Uh, the other uh, is that I think I disagree about how conservative movements have been successful. Okay. Uh, but I'll start with time span because that relates to my second point. Uh, time span thing is that, uh, and this is something I've been talking a lot with my friends in the climate movement, uh, because there's a, for a very good sense, uh, for very good reasons, there's a um, sense of urgency in the climate movement. And this right now is, is the critical moment in time for the climate movement. Um, and for one reason or another, I've been reading a lot about history of the climate movement, because in the 80s, there was a really uh, huge climate movement already. There were uh, uh, congressional hearings. Uh, there were, you know, uh, international agreements being drafted. Uh, and that whole thing was the reason why the uh, fossil fuel industry 
uh, launched their whole lobbying campaign against in full force in the early 90s. And, and that had remarkable success in stalling all those efforts. Uh, then there was like, say, the 2005, I think, documentary by Al Gore, which mm-hmm. launched one part. It was Rio de Janeiro in 92. Uh uh, climate discussions. Uh, I was just watching with my students, my 12 year old students, uh, clips from movie The Day After Tomorrow, which yes. is from 2004, yep. which is about climate disaster. Um, and I, I uh, talk about this in the terms of Groundhog Day, but I think uh, climate movement is always having this Groundhog Day, uh, referencing <laughs> the Bill Murray film. Right. That they're always coming up, you know, that, that this is the final, this is the. Uh, exact moment when we have to take a stand um and of course that is always true it is always you know the important time to make action uh but i think it would be useful to think about those terms in in time spans of especially with climate you have to think about in time spans of 50 years or 100 years uh and the example i like to use here in finland is the finnish national movement uh, which fought for independence in Finland uh, back in the 19th century when Finland was still part of Russia. Uh, and that movement almost didn't even dare to dream about uh, independent state, you know, in 1860 or something, uh, because it was such a foreign concept. But they fought for recognition of Finnish language or, or recognition for uh, Finnish currency and school system and so on. And a lot of people in that movement never lived to see independent Finland, which realized only in 1917. Um, and I think that kind of attitude is something that is required for progressive movements and climate movements. When, when you're trying to, when you talk about, you know, far off uh, goals such as democratic economy. And this brings my uh, second point just briefly, is that I don't think the conservatives are winning at all. Uh, and actually, this is something that the writer I referenced, Corey Robin, in his book also says that he suspects that these are the dying uh, gasps of both the conservative movement and also the capitalist system, that it's it's not going to out with the sort of bang or revolution that uh, left is so fond of tr- fantasizing about, but slowly declining away because it just doesn't work with real real world economies. And the same with conservative movements. It really just doesn't give people the kind of answers and the kind of solutions that in long term societies need. And that's why progressives are actually in sort of a strong stance when it comes to you know, decades to come. I want to I want to throw in, you know, one short comment about one of the things that that, that Auntie just said about whether our, our enemies on the other side um, have a history of being more strategic in their strategy than we have on the left. And I think there's some truth to that. And I still think that far and away, the most insightful book that Naomi Klein ever published was her first book, which was Shock Doctrine. And what she pointed out, which I think was, you know, very, very perceptive at the time, um, was that conservative organizations and political parties, they have a very clear agenda of things they want to make happen. And they're aware that often they can't do that. They don't have the political power to push something through. They look at crises as opportunities to, in a moment, push something through that they could not have pushed through. You know, they could not have pushed that that sort of change through in normal times. And I think that is a very important way to think about strategy, that we sort of are fighting for things we want and reform movements, et cetera, et cetera. Um, And there are limits on what we can gain during normal times. But the way to view, the left has always viewed crisis as it's going to automatically, you know, the crisis will lead to a breakdown in the present system, and then the new system will magically appear. And I think a much more realistic way to think about crises is those are the rare opportunities 
when things can happen that wouldn't been that wouldn't have been possible during normal times. Um, <clears throat> most of what Naomi Klein has written since then, I don't think is nearly as perceptive, particularly on things like climate change. Um, but I think that that was that was something that that she realized from thinking about how the how the right operates in the world and comparing it to the left. Yeah, and I think it goes way back to social democratic movements as well, because they, uh, way back, had an opportunity when people thought that, you know, we need things like, you know, welfare systems or, or in, uh, income support or, or, or transfers of wealth and taxes and so on. And, and they had a chance to push it. And depending on the country, uh, they succeeded. Luckily, in Nordic countries, they succeeded pretty well. But it was a tumultuous time, and they managed to push, push through exactly in a sort of shock, shock doctrine kind of way. Um, and the right wing did the same. But I th think that the right wing, uh, the conservative movement, or I'd say sort of the capitalist movement, has the problem. They've managed to do that in a lot of countries. They've managed to do it very well, and, and, and they've been very successful, no doubt about it. But the problem is that the other part of that is that you have to be ready when there are such moments that's possible to renegotiate how our societies work. But you also have to have ideas that actually work, that actually, you know, manage to do those things in consistent manner, not just for one generation. Uh, and this is something that I think the conservative mo movement has troubles with because the simple and, you know, it's an idea that's easy to grasp and people seem to like it, which is that, you know, the more money you have, the more you can do and you work hard and you get money and that's the end of it. Government shouldn't, you know, do anything because it only breaks things up. The problem with that is that it just doesn't work. So in the end, you're going to have people starting questions at some point that, wait a second, guys, this doesn't work. What are we going to do about it? Um, and that's why I think, and I think it's something that Naomi Klein actually writes in the Shock Doctrine book. I'm not sure, uh, but it's definitely the way I, I, I've always sort of thought about uh, societal change is that we as progressives or people wanting a more democratic economy have to use the time we have to make our ideas as robust and as credible as they can be, because the moment when they're actually actually put into use might be really surprising and then if they're not you know good enough then we might solve problems down the road yeah um in the history of um uh the evolution of life and and analysis about this uh there's a famous uh theory that's known as punk eek short for punctuated equilibrium um it's the idea that um at least when it comes to the evolution the the changes that occur within the history of life on earth that there are long stretches where things happen slowly and you can track them over millions of years and then a very sh and then these are punctuated they're interrupted by very short time spans comparatively speaking where a lot happens and so this kind of echoes with what we see kind of like in the discussions regarding um societal change where um yeah, the kind of work that you're like, maybe that we're doing right now regarding laying the groundwork through the various efforts that we're doing now that um, will take a long time, but then something dramatic will happen out of the blue. And then suddenly a lot of changes possible or potentially so in a very short amount of time that wouldn't have happened otherwise. So the same idea could apply there. Yeah, Robin? Yeah, I think, I mean, I was thinking when you were talking about, you know, the, the movement, Wall, you know. Occupy Wall Street. Right. Occupy Wall Street here in the United States, that even, even after the fact, if you look back and say, how probable was that to play out the way it played out? It actually was rather improbable. Oh, yeah. That, <laughs> so, and that's one of the things that makes strategy, um, it's less of a science and it's more of having intuitive insight and being nimble, sort of recognizing that, you know, 
And and because be, be, because the right thing to do, you know, can sometimes be so improbable, you have to be you have to be willing and able to sort of shift your thinking rather dramatically, you know, about what it is that, you know, now has become possible or what now has become impossible. Um, I do think that the. I st- I I. I I do think that for the United States, um, the the, I mean that 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 section of the book, you know, that was that about strategy for the United States, about social movements, um, progressive social movements, different progressive campaigns, um, you know, different kinds of building experiments in the you know building building creative experiments about democratic egalitarian alternatives, even within capitalism. I I do think that that has stood the test of time in the sense that that was written basically and published 20 years ago. And I do think that the only thing that's changed is we didn't make much progress in many of those areas. And some of those campaigns have weakened, you know, rather than strengthened, in particular, the labor movement in the United States. Um, you know, we are the labor movement in the United States is in much worse shape and is much weaker now than it was 20 years ago when I was writing about it. And it wasn't that strong back then. So there are changes in which of these forces, you know, is relatively stronger and relatively weaker that have to be taken into account. Um, but I still think that given where we are in the United States, Assuming that we, per, assuming that the Republican Party Trumpist fascist threat is defeated, um, and I don't make that assumption yet. I think that we it would be premature for us to believe that oh that battle has been won. Um, but assuming that it is won in the next few years, um, I still think we are unfortunately not much farther along that trajectory of needing to do all those kinds of things to get ourselves ready for something that is a a major step forward in terms of system change. The uh, the other thing I want to do is let let let's just list some things that in terms of strategy these are some things I think we've learned don't work. Okay. And yet I mean one thing is Marxist Leninist sects as you know, as the political vehicles yeah. for moving us away from capitalism and towards socialism. Yeah. The, the, the line I always hear in Chicago is they're the vanguard. Right. <laughs> Only a vanguard party. You hear this at protests all the time. That's right. And it's and, just like, and I think that, and, I, and I think not everywhere, not everybody, but more or less all around the world without having sort of just formally declared that we are done with that because it doesn't work. Mm-hmm. I think it's sort of, I think that has died a slow death and, you know, may may they rest in peace. <laughs> um, another thing, I mean, the Bernie Sanders campaign and whether or not progressive social change activism should participate you know, in a major way in electoral politics in the United States. So if you, when I think of my period of activism in the United States, basically from the mid 1960s up to the present, um, for most of that time period, um, progressive left activists who really wanted some sort of significant system change here in the United States, most of us basically said, Participating in the election process is just not, it's not, it's not part of our strategy. It's not where we put our efforts into. When we put our efforts into that, they are badly spent, they are co-opted, and we should, we need to build social movements, um, but not participate in, and I, and I think that was always a dilemma. Um, we went through the Nader third party, then Bernie Sanders figures out how to do it inside the Democratic Party because of the particular political reality and rules of the game here in the United States. Um, so I think that's another area. Have we learned the lesson that this is an area of activism that is so important 
if you are going to reach people and actually accomplish things, you know, to move things forward, that it would be a terrible mistake to avoid that. How about violence? How about whether or not, you know, I mean, I know segments of the U.S. left that didn't want to sign on to we should become a society like the rest of the civilized world where any Tom, Dick or Harry who wants to tote around an AK-40, you know, an, a an AK-15 rifle and walk into a government building that we are going to protect. We didn't have unanimity on the left, you know, around gun control. And the argument was, well, the bad guys are always going to have gun because the police and the military have guns. Um, so why should we sign on to something where we never have any guns? So I think that's another area um, where there was naivete. We've learned some lessons. And whatever our strategy is, um, at least in our kinds of society, that strategy is not going to include, you know, militarizing ourselves. As much as the right wing and the Proud Boys and everybody has militarized themselves in the United States. Well, the question is, should the left militarize ourselves or not in response to that? Um, and I I mean, so. And the, the other thing I'd like to say is when I look at Latin America um, and when I think about the whole situation of guns. One of the things one of the things that progressives and, and, and leftists have learned in Latin America is that in a situation where the other, in a situation where the citizenry is not armed, well, we went through the whole um, you know, so Che Guevara, we are gonna have armed foco guerrillas. And I think in Latin America, they've basically learned that that strategy is not one that's gonna take them forward. Um and successful left movements in Latin America usually figure out some way to either make sure that the only people with the guns, the actual military, that they are sidelined so that they don't take a side, or you actually build some sort of organizations within the military, which is what Chavez did in Venezuela. In Venezuela, the military was actually in favor of the Chav the Chavista, you know, movement. Um, so I, I think that's another area where we're talking strategy and we're talking tactics and what works. And in the context of different strokes for different folks in different times and different places. But I do think there's some things that we ought to just sort of make a list of things we have learned in this area, um, and be and become more clear about them. Auntie, do you have any things to add to that list? Um, well, a lot, uh, but <laughs> uh, I'll pick from one from my pouch of what the, what progressives have done wrong. Um, and I'd say uh, one of the uh, more recent ones is which actually I think started with Occupy movement, um, in broader terms, and is uh, has begun especially in climate movement and extinction rebellion and so on. Is this uh, movement of the positive thing is that these movements since Occupy have been talking a lot about democracy within the movement and in society. And that's a good thing. That's a good thing to uh, keep, you know, in major focus. Um, but these movements of um, having these different sort of actions and, and very dramatic uh, things happening or having these mass movements that have young people throwing blood at sports cars or or something very disruptive in that sense. Um, and also having these very hectic moments that they're planning some sort of action, and then it's a big action, and then people get arrested and so on. Um, I think there are many problems with that. Uh, one of them is that it really focuses the whole movement in the young people. Uh, and this is something that I think movement should be discussing more, I think, in general, that if you're doing the kind of strategies that require peoples in people in their twenties who have a lot of time, uh, who are in you know Western countries, uh, and who are willing to do you know the kind of really crazy stuff, uh, it just it's a very small subset of population that can partake in that, and it also 
sends a little bit strange message. And th this has been going on a lot, I think, in movements. Um, and the major climate movements recently have been about these strategies. Um, and it also presents a problem because these movements tend to have this life cycle, which resembles uh, a 20 or so person's life cycle in, you know, in general terms that they rush out on the sea and they're like, everything has to change right now. And then they do these actions and then they get tired and then they start bickering up with their probably for Marxist Leninist sects and, and what have you, uh, and start bickering amongst themselves. And then any new people coming in have no chance whatsoever to have any sort of uh, advocacy. There are superstars in the movement and the new, you know, 17 year olds who come in are just fans of these new stars and then they start to get bitter and they move away and then the movement dies and i think this and then you know in five or ten years time a new movement rises with new 17 to 19 year olds who are you know coming up with the idea that, hey everyone wake up the world is dying um and that kind of i i think that's not a good model for for actually changing the society over decades and decades of activism. Um, and I think that's, that's a very big problem. Um, it's, I think Michael Albert calls it also a stickiness problem, that yeah. how to you know, preserve people in the movement. And I think that's a very good point from him, that I think that's the kind of movements that uh, people should strive to build, that they are vague enough, they are loose enough, they are willing to do reforms whilst uh, sticking to very radical goals uh, and that they don't burn out people and also that they don't too much emphasize peoples of certain uh, groups, which can also, can also be age groups or, or, or people, you know, who are just enough well off that they can say, you know, go to academy or they don't have to go to work so much so, so they can do ac activism more and all those kind of barriers to activism. I think that's something that has been a mistake and should be talked about more. I, I would agree with that. I would agree with a lot of what, with, what Andy just said. Um, and, and, the, and, and the problem of burnout, um, I mean, another way to think of it is if everybody who at one point in their life was sort of actively involved and committed to social change, stayed that way, you know, for the rest of their life, we'd be in a lot better shape. Yeah. And, yeah. and so, well, well, why doesn't that happen? And the answer has to be that somehow our activities and what we do do not, they don't give somebody sort of they don't provide people with a way to remain active and committed that is reasonable with growing older, having families and moving on. Um, that we've done a very, very poor job of that. And, and I mean, that's just, for me, I just think, well, that's one part of strategy. Once you've, re once you've sort of, you've kindled in people's minds and emotions, oh my God, what we have here is terrible. I understand why it's terrible. I understand, I have a vision of what it is that would be so much better. Well, how do you, how do you sustain them? You know, give them ways to live their entire life and raise children and work at jobs where they, where they can, where there, where there are sensible and meaningful activities that they engage in and that, you know, while, while doing that. That's not something that we have done well. This has been Pep Talk, the Participatory Economy Podcast, the podcast where we discuss the democratic alternative to capitalism known as a participatory economy. In this episode, we've been talking about the question of strategy and related issues toward the participatory economy. To find out more, please visit the website for the Participatory Economy Project at participatoryeconomy.org. There you can sign on to a monthly online newsletter, uh, as well as join an online forum to discuss this and many other issues related to a participatory economy. Um, I've been, I'm have been Mitchell Stepanczyk from Chicago. On behalf of Antti in Helsinki and Robin in Portland, Oregon, thank you for watching or listening. Bye. Bye. Great to have been with you. Thank mm -hmm. you.
Could you please tell us um, what you see as the alternative? Self-management, democratic control of communities or workplaces, federal arrangements. Participatory democratic planning. Jobs that have a mix of empowering your nesting council linked to one another. Everyone gets to participate in a primary council. Please visit participatoryeconomy.org to find out more and subscribe to our newsletter. And don't forget to like the video, leave a comment, and subscribe to our channel. Thanks, and see you at the next episode.